Citizen is the catchy acronym for the slightly less catchy Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeological Network. Um, I'm in this talk. I'm going to look at the aims quickly at the aims and methods of the project, um, and then look at how we plan provision when we began the project. How we plan provision for 16 to 25 year olds. How we carried that out um, in our first year by looking at three case studies. Uh, how far our plans have worked, and then what we plan to do next year in 20 minutes. So. Um, so, first of all, this is a slide on the left of Haysborough, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, it shows the problems with coastal erosion. The top picture in 1998, you see the ramp that leads down to the sea, that's uh, the lifeboat ramp, our NLI ramp. And as you can see from the bottom picture, by 2007, they were all gone. So it's a really good illustration of the problems that are facing the coastline of England. So Citizen is, um, as it says, a response to the threats of erosion to coastal and, and estuarine heritage. Um, it's a means of preserving sites and features by record and making those records easily available, which I'll mention more about in a second. And um, perhaps most importantly, it's a community archaeology project um, providing, promoting volunteer-led recording and monitoring. And the idea is that we... We, um, we provide the training and then we encourage the volunteers to then form their own groups and um, carry on recording on their own. And it's based on Thames Discovery Programme, who've been running for seven years and trained about 500 people who now work in autonomous groups. And also um, SHARP, Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk Project, who, all, who have been running uh, a volunteer-led programme recording heritage in Scotland. We've got three years of HLF funding. We've just finished our first summer season, so we've got two summers left. Um, and two years left to, to do what we said we'd do. And we've got an HLF priority audience of 16 to 25 year olds. So, um, the pro this is just to show the project England wide. We're three teams. So, I've got Megan and Andy who are sitting here, they're the North team. There's me and Oliver Hutchinson who sadly can't be with us today because he's very poorly. We're covering the South East. Then, we've got Lauren and Alex in the South West. And then our project leader, Gustav, and project officer, Stephanie, who are based in London. So we're quite a small team to cover quite a large area. Um, this is the sort of hard, um, the hard product of the project. It's an interactive map. It's accessible by the website. Uh, it contains 80,000 records taken from various sources. People can check what's in their area, update records, add new sites. Um, and you can currently do that via... Um, downloadable forms from the website. The intention was that it would be mostly by app, and that's also something I'm going to return to later. Um, the app should have been up and running at the beginning of the project. It's probably just about to have the red button, the red go button pushed on it, um, and should be available soon. But that's, yeah, something I'm going to return to. Um, a little bit more about the app. It does work offline. Um, yeah, so the iPhone version is imminent and the Android version is to follow. Uh, and yeah, it was meant to be there from the start, but that was teething problems. So so how how we encourage people? I mean, people can just down, go out with the forms on their own and record sites, but we encourage people to take one of our training courses. They last generally two days. It's free. Um, we ran about 14 last year across across the whole of England. Uh, we start in the classroom with a bit about the citizens' general aims, then an introduction to the site. We look at um, research that's been done on the site and suggest further research that people could do on the site. And we also talk about how, um, after the site, what people can then do to spread the data so they can add to the uh, add to the map or we encourage people to write blogs for the website. Um, and we encourage people to talk to each other. Our team, this is... Um, from Suffolk, a site that we did in Suffolk, uh, in Harkstead, and uh, the group after that one actually set up their own Facebook page and have been talking to each other and have gone on to record other sites since, or are recording other sites since, and that's really what we want people to do, so that's great. Um, yeah, so we do foreshore recording over a couple of days. Um, we're just about to start issuing the Badger Passport, as well. Badger Passport, which you can have a look at after. Um, it's MVQ compatible. One of the things we wanted to offer in the first year was the MVQ, because MOLA has two MVQ assessors in place. Um, I should have said we're based at MOLA in London with uh, the North team based with the CBA in York and the Southwest team based at the NAS. 
Um, the MVQ is something we still hope to roll out, and we're going to be looking at that, I think, in the next year or the final year, because it, it would be a really, really good thing to be able to offer, especially for young people. Um, across the regions, we have, we've had some 16 to 25 year olds come along on our training sessions. There's one pictured here. Uh, some have been members of local archaeology societies, some have seen it on university bulletin boards, others saw it on the website, and we've had a few that have done work experience at MOLA and then wanted to come out with us on a training course. Um, but now I'm going to look at actually, you know, how we planned for provision, um, what we've actively done to try and reach the 16 to 25 age group. Um, in the development phase, a uh, questionnaire was sent out by the CBA and um, Citizen <coughs> Stroke Mola. The Citizen Mola one went to specifically 18 to 25 year olds. The CBA one also went to YAP groups. 50 respondents, relatively evenly distributed geographically and occupationally, so the students, people working, people searching for work, uh, people in training. Um, broadly, the reasons agreed across the two surveys that um, the wish to broaden our training in archaeology was the main reason. Um, no, I, that's a really stupid thing I wrote then. Wish to broaden experience in archaeology, I should have written, obviously. Um, that was the main reason people wanted to take training. They wanted to try something new, relevant to studies, relevant to location. The interesting one, it sounds fun. 45% of people who answered the citizen questionnaire said it sounded fun to do some archaeological training. Only 9% of people who answered the CBA one thought it sounded fun. So I'm not sure that's a bit of a strange. But anyway, um, there was, I mean, I have to point out there was no free text, so people couldn't answer other than those, those questions. The main barriers uh, were transport, and that's something Citizen addressed by all the teams have vans, have nine seater minibuses, so we can collect people, take people to site, bring them back. Uh, work commitments and need for paid employment was a big, was a big barrier. Uh, our training courses are free. Um, they generally run on weekends, but of course then you're going to run into problems with people who have weekend jobs if their if their students are working. So uh, maybe that's something we need to look at as well. Um, because, as I said, because it only went, the questionnaires went out to people who are obviously already interested in archaeology, we did consult Sharp, who I mentioned earlier, the Scottish project, about their experiences um, of reaching 16 to 25 year olds. And the main thing that came back from them was uh, that the digital element was really, really popular. Um, so that obviously relates, again, to one of the, not the main, but one of the reasons that we, that we had the app that isn't delivered yet. Um, so I'm going to trot along to some case studies. And the first one looking at is Filey Girl Guide, senior section. This was um, some sessions that Megan and Andy carried out um, with senior guides. They have a program called Look Wider. It's a three-phase personal development program uh, with elements in um, community action, getting out and about, um, Creativity, I think, is one of them as well. And so in that way, Citizen can fit in quite nicely, especially with the Community Action Project. Phase one, Try It, was the one that Megan and Andy uh, delivered in. Um, so they did finds and feature identification, health and safety on the foreshore, and archaeological planning. And they took their beautiful portable foreshore with them, which has been a great success, apparently. Um, and has... You can just see in the bottom photograph at the back the person leaning by a fish trap that they're recording. Um, the others are recording a submerged forest. And they also have elements of marine elements, marine engineering elements in there as well. Um, none of the girl guides were thinking of archaeology particularly as a career when they took the session. But over the session it became apparent that they started to understand where archaeology could fit into their studies at school with history, geography and art. And I think this Working on working within this project, I think, is a really, really good example of how Citizen can fit into already established or how community projects such as ours can fit into established programmes for other youth groups um, and help them deliver their programmes. Um, I'm now going to look at uh, next case stage, Brighton University, Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Um, 
this wasn't a this wasn't a specific training session. It was a guided walk that we were asked to um, go along and give to second year students on a study trip to Berlin Gap. This is uh, here they are sitting after their walk along the foreshore, sitting up on the bank and draw, carrying on drawing. Um, it it was um, part of the land and sea option, which was a drawing option, and we were basically invited to go along because we'd done quite a lot of training sessions at Berlin Gap already. And um, I actually know one of the tutors on the course. So when she started talking about that she was doing this drawing option um, that was looking at the coastline, um, looking at the coastline, well, I said, that that's really interesting. We're looking at the coastline. It'd be quite interesting to bring our projects together. And actually, um, some words have disappeared from this slide because it's, I don't know where they've gone. It might be because it's open office. Would that be why? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I'll just have to remember what it said. But it did actually, there were, um, there were basically there were 18 students from a, a range of disciplines. So um, they came from fashion, 3D design, art, uh, fine art, photography, heritage studies, interior design and architecture. Um, heritage and museum studies were actually only two of the students, which I was quite interested by. And the majority of the students were actually architecture students. And it turned out that they had another faculty option to design a uh, new visitor centre for Berlin Gap that would cope with the issues of erosion at Berlin Gap because the serious erosion there, they're losing on average 0.4 metres a year and sometimes up to one and a half metres a year after bad storms. And the visitor centre is sort of getting closer and closer to the edge, or rather the cliff is getting closer and closer to the visitor centre. So that was why a lot of those students chose to come on this course. Um, there was some really good feedback from the students. They said that they really they would never have gone into the landscape that deeply because it's quite a walk to where we were going um, to see some wreckage. You can just see behind the girl with the red hair. There's um, girl with the red hair. That's actually the tutor. Um, there's the wreckage of a, um, a ship called Ushla, which sank in about 1916. So that's why I took them out to sea. And then on the walk, pointed out the different features in the cliff. You can see some pits. There's some remains of buildings like pipes sticking out of the cliffs. So they were they were. They said it was really interesting to actually get a narrative behind the things that they saw. They wouldn't have known what those things were unless they'd come out with an archaeologist. They wouldn't have gone that far into the landscape. So they say it's about a 45-minute walk, and you have to be really careful of the tides in there because there's only one, one staircase in and out. Um, and, um, yeah, they said they gained a lot towards their studies, having a different view of the, different view of the foreshore to what they normally would. Um, For, I think for me, it was really interesting to see how they how they were in the landscape, how they interacted with the landscape, because it was very different. They were still drawing, which is what we've been doing when we've been going down there. But whereas we rushed down there with tapes and think, right, we've got to draw this wreckage before the tide comes in and everyone's talking and we're trying to explain stuff. We went down, I gave them the talk, and then they sat completely, pretty much completely still for nearly an hour just looking and drawing, which was... I think it was a really interesting way that they were seeing the landscape and that maybe gave me a greater insight to how we can communicate the project to people who aren't necessarily archaeologists. Um, and I think it also shows this case study also shows the relevance, the relevance of our project sort of beyond a traditional archaeology um, audience and how we can reach different audiences by trying to do slightly more cross-disciplinary stuff. Um, this is the nearly final case study. This um, is a project that we're doing in the southeast with uh, South East Essex Sixth Form College and Coalhouse Fort Park. Coalhouse Fort Park has amazing remains dating from, well, there's prehistoric uh, peat deposits, there's World War II remains and pretty much everything in between. It's a really interesting landscape. It is actually a scheduled ancient monument. So that is part of something we'll be looking at with the students as well. So it's A-level archaeology um, studies. Oh, I'll just go back. Actually, ah. um, on the left, that's Hazel Sacco. She's the education officer at Coalhouse Fort Park. Next to her is Jamie Spracklin, the A-level teacher. He's really, really keen for his students to have an understanding um, of the potential for an archaeological career. So he's working very closely with um, professionals such as Hazel, Oliver and I, South End Museums, and we're delivering sessions. We're all going to deliver sessions to his students so they can yeah, really have an understanding of how, how their studies could end up as a career. Um, 
so we presented two open days and he's now got it's the first year it was run there he's now got 17 students signed up so we've talked to them a couple of times already about what we're planning to do and this is what we're going to plan what we're planning to do with them we're going to take a week we're going to um we kind of structured it as though we're going from a desk-based assessment in commercial archaeology through to a, a full um, but non-intrusive survey. So we're going to look at research and do map regression um, and look at the issues of working with scheduled ancient monuments in the classroom. Then we're going to do a walkover survey, some foreshore work with plan and section drawing, for photography, uh, 3D modelling, and then look at um, dissemination, either by how you write a report or later on in the year there's going to be an open day and we're really hoping to encourage the students to present at the full public open day. Um, when I mentioned the app earlier and 3D modelling here, that's something we're really keen on in the project because of Sharp's experience and also what we're thinking as well, that, that would, that's a really interesting way in to, to capture the imagination of 16 to 25-year-olds. So we'll be doing some really nice sessions with that um and just as we started the project we we went to see um i don't know if you've heard of access cambridge archaeology uh higher education field archaeology project um they've been doing some really really interesting stuff with training training students and also looking at the the other skills that you get from archaeology so it skills team working project management verbal communication and building those, really strongly building those into actually what we're teaching them and making them aware that that's also what they're learning. Um, and we're also working on an assessment to give them the language that they need when they're writing application forms or doing job interviews. So, okay, two minutes. So, um, yeah, that's going to be a good project. And hopefully next year we'll be able to present on how well it went. And we're using it as a pilot for other, for other schools' projects. Uh, this was the case study that wasn't. Uh, we were going to use contemporary archaeology along the foreshore with a lovely Who Am I? A floppy disk, which actually I think probably most wouldn't, in the younger age, it might not recognise anymore. And a gun, but that actually went to the police. We don't have that. But we do have other mobile, ooh, mobile phone, Novotel card. And the idea with this was just to, to talk to students about contemporary archaeology and what these sorts of things say to people and what's they can tell, see what stories, the things they had in their pockets would tell about them and use that as a way in. So I hope we're going to be able to use that sometime. Um, so um, that was the nearly final case study. This is me summing up, um, saying, um, in general, in general, we didn't reach the level of provision we hoped for, for our priority audience. Um, there were issues. I think the app was a really big issue because that was something we really wanted to push, like they sort of training courses with the app. And also, I think we underestimated the length of time that it takes to, in your first year to meet people, to set up projects, um, to find sites. So we ended up working quite frequently with established archaeology groups, which then have the general demographic for um, archaeology societies, sort of 50 plus older, although we did. Obviously, you can see from the case studies, we did do some really good work. But we're going to learn from that. And next year, um, we're, there's some sort of main points of what the different groups are doing. Southeast, we're going to develop the Coalhouse Sport Project as a pilot. In the north, um, they're going to be working with Duke of Edinburgh Award candidates in Grimsby. So that's going to be really interesting to see how we can feed into that sort of project. In the southwest, they're also talking to students. Um, I'm going to be doing some stuff with students. We're also going to push uh, app training days or sort of walks and talks using the app on the foreshore, uh, developing further links with universities. Um, we have an idea to define research questions suitable for dissertations, and those will be written into the reports from, from each site. Actively targeting local universities and schools for local events, so actually really making an effort when we do a local event to contact all the schools in the area that are offering history or archaeology A-level and really encouraging them to come along to our training events and outreach events. And also developing sessions with uh, other interest groups with a younger demographic, such as Sea Cadets or Marine Conservation Society, whose demographic, I think, is mid-20s to mid-30s, so younger than the normal archaeological demographic. So, yeah, that's uh, where we've been, where we are and where we're going. And that's the end. <laughs>